Hello, I'm Steve Goldman, Director of the Center for Free Enterprise and Professor of Economics at the University of Louisville. Welcome to our first spring event of the Menard Family Lecture Series. I want to thank the Menard, the Menard family for their generous sponsorship of this series. I also want to thank the many partner universities who were listed prior to the beginning of this lecture for bringing this program to their students and their communities. We have two more events coming up this semester. Our next event will feature Jonathan Haidt, who will discuss his book, The Coddling of the American Mind, how good intentions and bad ideas are setting up a generation for failure. John examines the antecedents for rising intolerance to opposing viewpoints on college campuses. The event will be virtual on Monday, March 15th at 4, 4 p.m. Eastern time, and will also be part of the College of Charleston's Adam Smith Week. Adam Smith Week is a, is a week-long event where um, there'll be many events there. And so there's a sign-up link for John's event and also for the many events for Adam Smith Week in the chat. And you should check that out and, and sign up for these events. Our final virtual event will be April 1st at four o'clock and we'll kick off Second Chance Month. We will have a panel discussion about second chance hiring, the hiring of felons. Our panelists will be three individuals who had different roles in the Second Chance Movement. They share their experience, they'll share, they'll share their experiences, talk about how companies can get involved in successful second chance hiring and the benefits from hiring individuals with criminal records. Stay tuned for more information to come on that very interesting program. Finally, for you students, as you start thinking about your major and the classes you'll take next, next fall, I want to encourage you to consider economics. Economics majors, are very successful in the US and their starting salaries average around $71,400. You can do a lot with a degree in economics. For example, you can be a market research analyst, a financial analyst, economic consultant, an attorney, an actuary, a management consultant, a credit analyst, or a business reporter, and amongst many other things. So major, or at least co-major in economics. And at UofL, you can choose to either get a BA with all the eight arts and sciences requirements so you can co-major in whatever your arts and science degree is if you choose, or you can get a BS with all the business requirements and you can co-major with a business degree if you so choose. You also might wanna consider minoring in entrepreneurship. At the, at the end of the lecture today, we'll open up to questions and we want you to use the Q&A section of Zoom to post your questions. Our moderator will then ask the questions. So I will first introduce our moderator, OJ Alec. OJ is a recent Center for Free Enterprise event participant. He spoke last fall with Terrence Sullivan about his organization, Anti-Racism Kentucky. OJ is also president of the Association of Independent Kentucky Colleges and Universities, a graduate of the University of Louisville and holds an MBA and PhD in leadership in higher education from Bellarmine University. While at UofL, OJ was the student body president and he's also a student in my class, Capitalism and Economic Freedom, the very first year that I taught it. Our speaker today is Clifton Talbot. He's a man who grew up on the Mississippi Delta at the height of legal segregation. Through hard work, life lessons he gleaned while working with his uncle Cleve, and an imagination that took him beyond the cotton fields of Mississippi, he accomplished a great deal, including being recognized by Time Magazine as, as one of America's most outstanding black entrepreneurs. Clifton spoke on campus last, last year, and while we were out to lunch, we had a discussion with him about Black Wall Street and the Tulsa race massacre that happened over 100, happened 100 years ago this year, actually. And this is a sad story that most Americans have probably never heard of. And it's certainly not in our history books, which is very sad. But um, some of you may have seen a little bit about it on HBO's The Watchman. But anyhow, I'm gonna let Clifton tell you all about it. So OJ and Clifton, I uh, wanna thank you for being here. And we look forward to this talk. Well, thank you very much, Professor Goleman. Thank you for that introduction. Folks, thank you for being here today. It is gonna be a great conversation, a great discussion uh, with a man who is a living piece of history uh, in Clifton Talbert here. So I won't take too much of your time by talking. What I'll do is guide this conversation as we all listen to what Clifton has to say and we'll ask questions along the way so that we can learn and be more educated. So Clifton, you've had an incredible life experience. You've got incredible history to share with us. Why don't you start? Take it away, sir. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be with you to talk about a subject that continues to teach 
and that's the art of education to a great extent. Teaching never ends, nor does learning. And so to bring this conversation to the table today to all of us that are assembled, I'm very delighted to be able to do so. Of course, this all happened in Tulsa, Oklahoma, 100 years ago. But there was a time in history when Tulsa, Oklahoma did not exist as a state and a city. It was Oklahoma and Indian territories. So prior to 1803, when the Louisiana Purchase took place, that is when the territories came into the domain of America. So we'll get a chance to talk about that. But in the meantime, let's keep moving. And one of the statements that I, I'll, I want to kind of own this statement, I think I'm the first person to have ever said it, probably not. But if no one can you know, tell me I did, I'm gonna own this. History is indeed a great teacher. The challenge we have is we must attend class. And, and, and that is where the learning takes place. That is where the transformation takes place. And, and that is so important as we move our lives forward, not only for ourselves, but for the students we teach and the children we bring into the world. So let's take a look at how did Black Wall Street come about? Uh, what, what, what happened? Where, where did it all start? And if you look, the first start was 1619, uh, when the Africans came to this country in 1619 and became part of servitude and slavery. And of course, following that was 1803, the Louisiana Purchase. Now, why is that important? Because once the territories became part of the United States, it also became home to many of the native tribes and nations in our country that were primarily on the eastern shores of the then United States. 1832, Andrew Jackson instituted the Removal Act, and that meant that the native nations that lived in Tennessee, the Carolinas, and places like that, perhaps even Mississippi, where the Choctaws lived, they were all given an option, which was very one-sided, basically, but they had to leave and create a new home. So that is called the Trail of Tears. But what many people do not know that in the Trail of Tears or on that trail, if you will, there were thousands of enslaved Africans who had become slaves in this country. And they too would find themselves in the territory. Now, all of it becomes important because of what happens subsequent to all of that. Now we have the Civil War. The Civil War brings about 1863, the Emancipation Proclamation, and eventually 1865, the 13th Amendment, which basically frees pretty close to 4 million enslaved people in our country. And at some point in time between 1865 and 1877, we had something I would call it light in the darkness, if you will, the Reconstruction Act in the South, where Black men and women were in the process of education, educating themselves and their children, because life for the most part in the Southern states still remained legally segregated for the most part. But there was a moment in time that there seemed to, that there would be another way of living our lives. But let's, let's move on. Okay, now keep in mind, 1865 brings about the 13th Amendment, 1863, the Emancipation Proclamation. But from 1619 to 1865, that's 246 years of servitude and slavery. Now, in 1865, this ends to a great extent. But I want you just to think about it. 246 years, that's a long time. And if you multiply 246 years by 365 days per year, you have over almost 90,000 days of slavery and servitude. Almost 10 generations of being in that environment. So how do you get out of that environment and find yourself doing something entirely different? The former enslaved were basically staking their claim. And how did that look? Black visionaries, Edwin P. McKay, O.W. Gorley. Edwin P. McKay was born free in New York. But what is interesting, he had a very prominent government job there, but he'd heard about the territories. By now, the territories had become news throughout the United States. 
It had not discovered oil yet, but land was for the most part free. And that was very important to those people who worked on the East Coast and didn't have access to land. And then of course, the over 4 million enslaved people now free, they would now have access to land as well. So all of this began to happen and Cave, McCabe as you will, had a vision for an all black state along with native people. And uh, he, he worked toward that goal, he was the founder of Langston, which still exists today, a town in Oklahoma and also one of the founders of Langston University as well. But O.W. Gorley was much closer to it. He was, he was from Arkansas, an Arkansas entrepreneur, educator. But in 1906, he was credited with the opportunity, if you will, of getting the first plot of land that would become part of the centerpiece that would create what was known as Deep Greenwood, which later became known as Black Wall Street. In 1906, Greenwood was planted. Black Wall Street in the making, the gathering of black gumptioneers. Now, you may not have heard the word gumptioneers before, but that's a Cliff Colbert word for you. Because in those days, the entrepreneurs, that term was not widely used. In fact, it's a French derivative anyway. So most people in the Mississippi Delta and the Carolinas weren't speaking French, but they all knew the word gumption. And they would say, things, if you have gumption, there's nothing you can't accomplish. So in 1906, as Deep Greenwood was becoming a reality, in my mind, I called it the gathering of black gumptioneers. And, and, and these are black people that were coming from many different walks of life. Many of them, if you remember 1832, the Trail of Tears, 1865, freed all of the enslaved Africans who were part of the native nations. So now they were able to gather themselves into geographical areas and create towns and communities of their own. But then there were the three blacks from the Southern states primarily. Now they heard about what was happening in the territories, the free land, almost free to a great extent, and they formed wagon trains. And this to me was very exciting because having watched many movies most of my life, I always saw wagon trains, but I don't remember seeing any black people on the wagon trains. So I just assumed that the only pioneers were white pioneers, but that's not true at all. Uh, that is not true for Mississippi, from Arkansas, from Alabama, from South Carolina, from North Carolina, from Georgia, from Tennessee. These black people were in their caravans of wagons headed toward this place that they had not been, but the rumors were that this was the place to go the gathering, if you will, of Black gumptioneers, I think is absolutely exciting. And when you go back, if you will, and, and began to look at 246 years of being enslaved or in some form of servitude, and now you're in your wagon train, you're headed west to accomplish your dreams. And think about it. You had options now. And the option could have been how do I get even for slavery for 246 years of forced servitude? Instead, these men and women set out to build their field of dreams. That absolutely is amazing to me. And had gotten to the point that the newspapers of the day, because nearly every small black town that was created in those days had a newspaper, which I find to be exciting as well. Because as most of us know, that during slavery, it was illegal for a black person to learn to read or write. And if a white person were, was caught teaching him or her to do so, they too would be almost subject to death or something similar as well. So the idea of an education was something that was held far from these people. But yet once freedom reigned, all of a sudden that became a pursuit that even goes into today in the 21st century. So let's take a look, if you will, at what happened in the territory. 1906, you have Greenwood being planted, but you have men and women coming from different places throughout the country, bringing with them their dreams and the things that they wanted to accomplish. And one of the people, or one of the people who, in, who was involved in that was a gentleman from Kentucky, J.B. Stratford from Versailles. 
Kentucky. He was born in 1861 in slavery. His father was called Caesar Stratford, who was also enslaved as well, as was his mother. He died in 1935 in Chicago. It's interesting how he got from Kentucky. And by the time he came to Oklahoma with his wife, Augusta, he was also a lawyer, but he was also a gumptioneer, an entrepreneur, if you will, who was part of the building of Black Wall Street. An incredible man whose family, even though they left Oklahoma, became very unique in law and in government work, even with one of his granddaughters becoming an ambassador. Just a great story. And then there's John and Lulu Williams, a mogul family. And the reason, this is so important to me, you got the mom, the dad, and the son. We call that the potential for generational wealth right there in their midst because Lulu Williams owned the Dreamland Theater. And what I find to be so unique about it, it wasn't listed as John Williams Theater, but the proprietor's name was Lulu Williams. So you're talking about the independent female that was making her mark in the early part of the 20th century, this black lady was doing so and had made a great stand with the theater that will seat almost a thousand people. This is 1919, 1916, 1917, building its way up to 1921. And then of course, faith has always been a part of black lives. And, and for many of them, when they came into the territory, they didn't have churches of their own. So they, they met in places that may have been cow sheds or lean-tos or maybe in a home. But as soon as they got the wherewithal, they set out to build the edifices of their own. And one of those churches is the Mount Zion Baptist Church that they built. Former slaves and their children raised the funds to build this incredible edifice, which in today's market would be worth $1.8 million or slightly more. Again, keep in mind, 246 years of slavery and servitude. 1865, you're now free. Who are you? Who will you become? And what will you do? What contributions will you make? Well, let's talk about something else on Black Wall Street as well. How did the wealth of Black Wall Street happen? Well, one of the things happened that maybe we have overlooked. In 1907, the territories became a state. Oklahoma Territory and Indian Territory came together and formed the state of Oklahoma. And when that happened legislatively, Oklahoma embraced the Jim Crow laws that were not necessarily part of the legal structure of the territories. And what did this mean? This meant that African-Americans now found it illegal to shop at places that were white owned or where white men and women patronized. So sitting right at the intersection of Greenwood being built, Oklahoma becoming a state, and legal segregation becoming a law. 1905, oil was discovered. The Glen Pool discovery was the largest oil field discovered in the world at that time. So Tulsa was growing by leaps and bounds with men with oil backgrounds coming from Ohio, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, et cetera, bringing with them their need for workers. So blacks became part of the workforce that supported the lives of the built very wealthy oil men and women who had found their lives on the Oklahoma, in Oklahoma as an oil state. So they made fair wages comparative to the days in which they lived. So, but what happened to their money? They couldn't spend their money outside of the area that had been defined as segregated unto them. So Deep Greenwood became the place where you had hundreds of stores you had movie theaters, you had library, you had schools, you had hospitals, you had medical facilities, you had Uber-like services, you had jitney services, bus services, all of these things were happening. And on Thursdays, and this is very interesting to me, it was called the Maid's Day Off because there were hundreds, literally hundreds of black men and women who worked as maids and butlers, yard men and, and, and husbandry type people in the wealthy sections of Tulsa. 
But on Thursday, they all came to Deep Greenwood. And that's where their money was spent. And that money circulated in that community more than you could ever imagine. And that was part of the wealth building of Black Wall Street. But also keep in mind, if we go back to 1832, the Trail of Tears, enslaved Africans, part of the Indian nations, 1865 freed them. And during the Dow's D-A-W-E-S land allotment, the freedmen received land as well. Almost three and a half million acres of land in the territory was owned by black people and much of that land also had oil. So all of these things worked together to bring about Black Wall Street as it became known. And of course, again, the story continues with the James Henry Goodwin family from Water Valley, Mississippi. Dr. A.C. Jackson, an incredible surgeon from Tennessee, man's meat market. And then there's Mr. Simon Berry from Grenada, Mississippi. He owned the only air charter service, black owned air charter service in the United States at the time and operated from a place called Black Wall Street. He became a philanthropist, also dedicating and giving to the city of Tulsa a part as well. And all of this was happening in 1919, 1920, 1918. These are the children and the grandchildren of those who were free in 1863 and in 1865. They so were Clifton, let me let me jump in here and ask you this question sure. because yeah. you you brought up something that I think is incredibly fascinating. As you mentioned, this wasn't that far removed from the generations of people who were enslaved. You had this wealth that was being built. You, you've explained to us how it happened, but we know that this story has a sad turn. Talk to us about the destruction of Black Wall Street and how we got from where we are now in the story to the very terrible tragedy that happened in Tulsa in 1921. Thank you. That, um, it is a sad story. And uh, let me talk about that story. Let me talk about what brought that about. May 30th, 1921 was Memorial Day all across America and Tulsa, Oklahoma notwithstanding. Keep in mind that World War I was probably a, a, other than on the territories where blacks were involved in the, in the in military. But for the most part, the, the war, the big war as it was called, brought a lot of black soldiers from their small communities into warfare in Europe. So they had now all come home. The war was over. May 30th was Memorial Day. Black churches, white churches, everybody was celebrating this. But on that day, May 30th, there was a time period there. There was a place called the Drexel Building, downtown Tulsa. The elevator was operated by a young white girl by the name of Sarah Page. And the story goes that as the elevator door opened, there was a young black man on the elevator who apparently, according to some, his foot slipped and he reached to hold the elevator lady so that he wouldn't fall. But when the door opened, his hands were on her and she screamed as the door opened to a flood of people waiting to get the elevator. And that is when the screaming start that this young black guy, Dick Rowland, accosted her and he was and they he got away from them at that moment but he was later found later placed in jail and there was the possibilities of him being hung for having done this the black soldiers who had now gained a bit of freedom emotional freedom if you will uh, for those who had served in France as one of our allies at the time in World War I, that was one of the few countries that would allow black soldiers to serve alongside the white soldiers. Well, these soldiers had come back to Tulsa, Oklahoma with a greater sense of self than what they had left. They had guns as well. And they were determined that this young black guy had done nothing wrong and that he would not be hung. And that became part of the starting point, if you will, of trying to free him and late that night when a gunshot went off, that became part of the tragedy that would eventually go through June 1st, where much of what had been accomplished 
by these newly freed slaves and their children would be ultimately and totally destroyed. This was Beulah land for many of them. And this is what happened. About 37 square blocks that they had built, their homes, their dreams, and all that they had became scorched to the ground. Very little was remaining that would remind them of the world they had built for themselves and that people across the country who read black newspapers all had a sense of this place on the territory that was different than any of them would have seen or could have imagined. This is one of the pictures that bring tears to my eyes when I see this. I can only imagine what this young boy would have been saying about his little sister or his brother. He's not heavy, he's my brother. They had nothing to do with the destruction, but they became victims of racism, greed, jealousy, the types of things that take away from us, that takes away from our humanity of who we are and who we can become. The people and their places were destroyed. In less than 48 hours, thousands of people became homeless because their homes were now gone. Most of the men were marched to the fairground and held as potential prisoners in their own community. And in order to get out of those places to go to work, green cards were issued to them to guarantee who they were and that they had the right to move about in a place that was their town, their home, communities that they had built, lands that they had purchased. The Mount Zion Church that I'd shown you earlier is now billowing with smoke. The Dreamland Theater that Lulu Williams was a proprietor has now fallen down, never to be as it once was. That world that they had built was being totally destroyed. They're in search of a home. That's what they are. Well, and that begs the question, and it's it's a remarkable thing that, that this could even happen in these United States. They were attacked, they were bombed. There was no government, their government, that should have been there to help them. But that's a, a conversation for another day. My question to you, Clifton, is this. Where did everybody go? You had people who were now homeless, people whose businesses were destroyed. What happened to folks? Where did they go and were they ever able to repair their businesses and get back to where they were? Great question. Where did they go? Thousands left Tulsa, many of them never to return. A great deal of them went to Kansas. A great deal went to Chicago, New York, Boston, California. But surprisingly, the soldiers, the black soldiers who had experienced a degree of freedom in Paris that they had never known before, they went to New York and took ships back to Paris, never to return to America again. And their descendants still live in Paris today. And, and J.B. Stratford and his family left and they went to Chicago where they continue to practice law with, uh, in fact, one of his grandsons, a great grandson is a very prominent lawyer in Chicago even today. So they went all across the country. They said the trains were full. Every mode of transportation was full, filled with black people leaving because they, they didn't have to worry about things to carry because there was nothing to carry. Everything had been burned, everything had been lost. They were in search of a home, a different place. But you ask a question, what happened then? Well, they rebuilt. By 1926, Booker T. Washington and, no, I'm sorry, George Washington Carter and W.E.B. Du Bois came to Tulsa because now the newspapers were printing stories that this town and community once destroyed has built itself up again. Greenwood was again striving and Black Wall Street had come alive but not with the same degree of life that it had in his first inception. Because that first inception, they had no models. They were their own models. 
And they built from their imagination. They built from their own concept of who they were and who they could become. So the voice of history, the intersection of the past and future, Black Wall Street rising. A hundred years later, what's going on in Tulsa right now? We are still trying to determine how many people were actually killed, how many Black people actually lost their lives. I mean, there are archivists from around the country working in Tulsa now, digging in places where there are supposed to be many bodies were dumped those that were not put into the Arkansas River and floated away, still trying to determine how many people passed away. However, let me just take a, a read one thing to you that I think is very, very important. This is based upon a diary of a Salvation Army colonel, a female, whose job during 1921 was to feed the release prisoners who were chained and shackled by the at their ankles, but they were the ones who were the grave diggers for those who had died. And this is what she said in her diary that has been published in this book by the Salvation Army. I'll read it very quickly. The city of Tulsa, which had heretofore enjoyed some degree of racial tranquility, became the scenes of a pitch battle between blacks and whites when a race riot erupted on June 1st, 1921. Before it was ended, over 800 blacks and whites were dead and the entire black area of the city burned to the ground. The only number we had heard for years in Tulsa was 300 people. But in her diary, she said over 800 people. And we know that the bulk of the people who died or were killed were not white, but black. So there's a big discrepancy between 300 and 800. And she was in charge of the black people who were prisoners who were let out of prison to dig the graves for those who had been murdered. Wow, that is an incredibly fascinating account from that diary. And, and your presentation today has been incredibly eye-opening and we all thank you for this portion of it. I do wanna make sure that we can continue to get uh, to people's questions. So please put them in the Q and A. We wanna make sure that we can hear from uh, the hundreds of people on this, involved in this conversation. We wanna hear from you, we wanna hear your thoughts. And it's interesting, someone mentioned something before about how the actions of that woman in the elevator, we see those things happening today. So the question I have for you, and, and it's a very broad one and, and admittedly it's a provocative one. There are some folks who might hear the story about Black Wall Street who say, well, that's unfortunate, but I'm not from Tulsa, so this doesn't matter to me. Or some folks will say, well, I'm not Black, so that's unfortunate, but it doesn't matter to me either. How does this story of Black Wall Street, both its rise and its destruction and the rebuild, how does that impact America today and why does it matter to all of us? A great question. It's the human story. It's a story that reveals the various aspects, if you will, of our shared and common humanity. To know the story, all the stories what if history would teach us, it gives us a better sense of who we are as Americans, not only who we are as individual ethnicities, but who we are as Americans. Abraham Lincoln made a very poignant statement in the Gettysburg Address. He said, can that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated long endure. He was speaking to the fragility of democracy. And that is why it's important to understand what happens when sisterhood and brotherhood slips away and we are left to our own maneuvering, our own greed, our own jealousy, our own racial tendencies, what can happen? This is history, this is a real reality, but we don't have to repeat the massacre of 1921. That to me is a great lesson of history to show us what we can do from a standpoint of our humanity, but also what we have the opportunity to do as we move ourselves toward a more perfect union. Hey, that's great, I think that's an excellent illustration. And 
uh, great harkening back to Lincoln's words. We are getting some questions in the Q&A. I want to ask this one first. Directly at the event itself, what was the reaction from the state or national government to any of this? And was anyone prosecuted? No one was prosecuted. Wow. There may have been what, maybe a couple of people held in jail overnight, no prosecution. Um, even most of the burned down buildings and homes of the blacks, they call it a riot so that the insurance would not have to pay them money on that. They, they, they lost on so many different errors. The National Guards were called in uh, and things like that to, that to hamper the peace. But for the most part, they had deputized white citizens. And, 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 and this deputizing of the white citizens were not to keep the peace, but they, to some degree, facilitated the rampage, the stealing, and, and the, the burning that took place on June 1st. Hmm. You actually have <laughs> made me think of, of a related policy. It's not an event, but redlining was something that many Black neighborhoods experienced all across the country around the same time in the mid 20th, early 20th century, basically where banks and governments colluded together to effectively keep out uh, Black families from owning any homes with no prosecution of the folks in Black Wall Street. And while redlining is now illegal, there was no real action to stop it. What can we do or what can people do to go against government sponsored or, or government enabled institutional racism? Every citizen, from my perspective, every citizen has a responsibility to really clearly understand who and what this country is, what built it and what made it. Um, and history, from my perspective, is also required to tell the whole story. I think part of our problem has been, we have not taken the time or the opportunity to tell the complete story of America's journey. And in so doing, we leave so many holes in history that a hundred years later, you find out stuff rather than dealing with it at the time of its happening. And to understand what happens when we cross the lines to do what is right, what is built and what is long lasting. What happens when we withdraw ourselves? For example, uh, about 10 years during the reconstruction period of time, uh, things had a glimmer of hope, but right seething underneath that was the Ku Klux Klan and everyone who wanted life to go back prior to Abraham Lincoln, prior to the Civil War. So all of the gains that came during that period of time of reconstruction, they were lost. So from about 1865 to 1964, you have almost 99 years of sharecropping and 99 years of legal segregation being in scouts and everything that we do. Slavery was a given. It was there and it ended. But what we put in its place was just as horrible and just as long lasting. It's a simple question uh, from one of our participants. Why isn't this taught in schools? That's not a simple question. That's a profound question. You know, I, I'm a firm believer that the truth is what we all need to know in order to better understand who we are as a nation. But the writers of history chooses, the writers choose as to what the history will look like and the stories that they will tell. And the stories that take these men and women of servitude who happens to bear the color of skin, because that is the primary factor America has been unkind to a lot of people. America was very unkind to the Irish. Irish need not apply. America was very unkind to Italian people from Southern Italy when they came to this country. America was very unkind to Catholics, very unkind to Jewish people. But all of these people had one thing in common that black people didn't have. They had the same color. We invested all of our fear, all of our hate, and all of our efforts of disregarding humanity, not in who the people were, but the color of their skin. And, it, and we did that since consistently for 200 
and 46 years. That is certainly the uniqueness of the black experience that it's discussed obviously, but I don't think it's fully understood from people uh, who don't take the time to fully understand it, which actually goes to one of the, the questions that's been asked several times. Can we replicate Black Wall Street? And if it's been done, where has it been done? I think that Black Wall Street is no longer a place, but I think it is a place that lives within your mindset, lives within your decision-making possibilities. It lives within the prospect of being proud of the fact that an African-American man or female, young boy or girl can make a meaningful contribution to the society in which we all live. And we set out to support that, uh, to give them the kudos for what they have done and to buy their products and their services and, and to be very unabashedly unashamed of that, but, but very proud of the fact realizing that there are so many hindrances that, that just happen by virtue of who these black entrepreneurs might be, that we wanna make sure that we help them to clearly understand that we want their success to be part of the American story and set out to make it happen. I don't know if a place can ever be that way again because legal segregation as it existed then does not exist today. Black people live all over America today. That was not the case in 1921. Essentially, Black Wall Street uh, is not a place, it's a people. It's a people. like the church. <laughs> it's a people. To that point about Black folks living everywhere across the country, one question has come in about policies like urban renewal or other initiatives that have negatively impacted uh, Black business districts. Do you think that this is a continuation of the same type of violence demonstrated in the massacre, or is it something different? I would say it is closely kin to 1921. And the reason I say that is because every major city in our country that had a thriving Black community, how in the world do you come up with a highway system that runs smack dab through the middle of it and destroy it in every major city in our country. Someone had to be thinking cohesively, collaborative and inclusively together to come up with that idea. Either they were saying we weren't of significant value or what we had created was an eyesore. Something had to happen collectively for this same act to be perpetrated throughout many of our urban cities throughout America in the same fashion and in the same manner. Because when I came to Tulsa, uh, as the, real, as the uh, highway systems were being built and urban renewal, looking at what can we get rid of in order to make way for something new, no one was thinking about the history of those people, the history of the people who looked like me or looked like you because there was this subtle idea that the better lived somewhere else. Well, and in, in you brought up this idea of, of how people think about black communities thriving. A question was brought up comparing two different communities in two different times. Uh, and I wanna wrap some ideas together here. The first one, what were other non-black communities like in terms of wealth compared to Black Wall Street during that time, during the 1920s? And then also, how did 1920 Tulsa, uh, in terms of the thriving businesses, compare to 1950s Atlanta, which was another thriving Black community at the time? Well, that's about four questions you put in one. <laughs> trying to get them all in. <laughs> well, I will say this, and try and answer it as best I can. At the same time that Black Wall Street existed, there were other Black communities doing well. There was Durham, North Carolina, had an incredible economic, economic power. Uh, and, and there were Elaine, Arkansas, that had one of the great massacres there. Over 385 people were killed. Uh, 
uh, there was uh, this town in Florida, and I'm trying to think of the name of it right now, where uh, Nor Thurston, the writer, wrote about this town quite often. In 1919, it was called the Red Scare, that many of the Black economic towns, over 25 of them, were either burned or completely devastated and gone. But one of the other aspects that was destructive to Black communities was 1932 during the time of the economic failure of our entire country during that period of time. And so you didn't have institutions that were supporting the Black businesses. When they lost, they lost. Whereas many of the white businesses had a, rec had a uh, resource from which they could regain their posture and come back again. Atlanta had with it, in, in addition to Morehouse and Spelman and the other colleges that were there, at Atlanta had with it a educated black populace that was, that was probably as widely known, maybe the only other place I'm thinking about the time would have been perhaps Nashville because Nashville had a multitude of black colleges as well. And interestingly, 1919, 1917, 1915, the blacks in Oklahoma, before it became a state, they would send their children to Nashville to Fisk University to complete their education. That's how committed they were to education. But the economic wherewithal that black people enjoyed for a period of time, that always something came along to destroy. It was not destroyed by black people themselves. Economic situations destroyed the inability to get enough money to stay afloat the inability to have relationship with the banking institutions. All of those things did not exist at the time for black people. Well, actually that, that brings up a, another question that has come up. You talked about the resources that might've been available for different communities. Of course, I think many of us know the GI bill and some of those policies at the federal level, black folks didn't really get to take advantage of because again of systemic and institutional policies that were set against us. This brings up the question that is being debated today in terms of policy, equality versus equity. Of course, there are two very different meanings, equality, right. everybody gets the same thing, equity, uh, each person gets what they need. Can you talk about those two ideas and how it might impact the discussion of Black Wall Street, uh, how to uh, come back from something like that and what that might mean in the context of, of these types of conversations? No, that equality, equity. I think that equity is probably taking more of a front seat uh, in this conversation today than equality. Uh, and, and I'm not smart enough to figure out all of the nuances of that. But I, I will say this, is that as a fellow human being uh, who wants for my family to have the best opportunity possible to maximize their potential, but in a world where you are a 10% portion of a country, 10 to 12% uh, of black people in America, we are not the major decision makers, but we are part of the decision-making group now more than ever before, but we are not necessarily the major decision makers. So we are still finding ourselves in a way of trying to not redefine, but to define in a way that you don't have to go back and redefine it every 10 years. Who are these people that live among us who look just like myself or you? Who are we? Because I think that question is still a question that people may ask privately or quietly, maybe without even talking to anyone. And I think that still impacts. Uh, in, in my world, I serve on the board of, of a bank and uh, as a director, and, and, and I'm the only person who looks like me on that board. And, and I have an opportunity to listen and, and try to get a feel for, if, if a loan is provided to a black person and he or she is not able to repay that, what happens to them? Are they given the same opportunity of trying to figure out their finances in such a way that they would have the opportunity to continue to win by virtue of having this, uh, the, the arms of concern wrapped around them 
as they would any other person. Um, I, I think we're still grappling with that. Uh, but keep in mind, and, and this is the hard part, for 246 years, it was illegal for us to read or write. And for many people, we were considered to be, from a brain and intellectual perspective, very shy of what most European Americans had, that we were the lesser of the human beings with not full control and full parity with everyone else. And that was thought of as reality by many, many people, and even so today. Case in point, I worked at a retirement facility out of college, and it was basically all white. There may have been a couple of black people there. And there was a one Southern white lady I would never forget. Uh, she called over to my secretary and said, come visit me. And she said, Mr. Talbert is one of the nicest people that I have ever met in my life. She said, I can't go on believing that someone that nice does not have a soul. That's the difference that a lot of people make and who we are and who we were. Wow, that is, that is an incredible story. It's an, an incredible firsthand account of how this can seep into people's hearts and minds. One of the other things that you brought up within the context of your explanation and your presentation was how wealth was kept within the Black community. There have been questions how do you do that today? How do you preserve Black wealth within Black communities if it continues to grow? Uh, do, you, do you buy Black like you would J.C. Penney's or Macy's? What, what would you suggest in terms of keeping wealth uh, within the Black community so that dollar can circulate and expand and grow? Well, the big question that we would have to ask ourselves, how many, quote unquote, Black communities are there in the sense of Black Wall Street? Because if you keep in mind in Black Wall Street, we all know the name John Hope Franklin, a great American historian, emeritus, uh, he's deceased now. But uh, when in, during the era of Bill Clinton, he was brought in to handle the issues of race in our country in a way that it had not happened before. Up From Slavery was the book that really set him apart. Great professor at Duke University. But in Black Wall Street, his father was B.C. Colbert, B. C., I mean, B.C. Franklin who was an incredible territory lawyer, but the territory lawyer lived in close proximity to the person who probably did not even have an education. So you had a, the community was a community of multiple people crossing paths on a daily basis. Today, the achieved black, black person all of them do not live in the same place together as people live in 1921. And because of that, you may have a black person with a business that's in the suburbs where there may be very few blacks and maybe uh, not so many. So what do you do? Do you make a decision to buy from that person? I, I think perhaps you should. But does it mean that's the only person you're gonna buy from? Probably not, because the world we live in today is not that world. But at the same time, as an entrepreneur, I believe that it should be a great joy if you can buy something from someone who looks like you, not because they look just like you, because of the history of having not the opportunity to really fly as high as we could. Because every time we started flying, someone would find a way to clip our wings. So you don't have to live next door to buy from a black person. You can do it. There's something that has been created recently that technology has done. It's called online. So there is no excuse not to support a person wherever they are. One question that has come in, how do you stay so positive and so hopeful despite all the challenges in the racism that we have today? 
Well, there's another reality. Uh, the Civil War, the 13th Amendment, the Emancipation Proclamation, though the likes of Frederick Douglass and, and other great names were involved, the reality is that there were other white Americans who were abolitionists, who believed in the freedom of all and set out to make it happen. Uh, I grew up in the time when the freedom riders came to the Mississippi Delta. There were as many white freedom riders as there were black freedom riders. I remain hopeful because I have seen, as Charles Dickens, Dickens said in the Christmas Carol, the best of times and the worst of times. I've seen the best of people and the worst of people. And they look like all of us, whether we are white, whether we are black, whether we are brown, whether we are yellow, or whether we are red. There are good people in every ethnicity and in every race. And to say that's not the case would be a lie. Well, and that leads to another question that came up. Obviously, not everyone, unfortunately, knows that or believes that. What should we as Americans do to make sure that we can prevent ourselves from tearing each other apart uh, like what happened at Black Wall Street? Is it education that needs help? Is it is it policy? Is it leadership? Uh, what would be your perspective? People tend to act on what they know, not what they don't know. And what we know is a cultural set of circumstances that starts from the very day we we're born. Um, it's, it's like Peter Senge says in mental models are created from the day we first cry or the day we first laugh. This 18 wheeler pulls up behind your life and into that 18 wheeler goes a whole lot of stuff. Some of it is not worth being there and some of those things are prized possessions. But what we have to do as people is do inventory, an introspective journey every so often into our lives. What have I learned over the last 10 years that makes absolutely no sense? How do I get rid of it and replace it with something different? We are still learning and becoming. We are still a very young nation. In 1832, Alexis de Tocqueville and Gustave de Beaumont, two young Frenchmen, they were millennials, not even 28 years old, came to America to study the penal system. But while here they made notice and took very good notes on our relationship with each other, the relationship with women and men as it relates to equity, the relationship between whites and blacks and native people as it related to equity and spoke to the issue that this will always be an issue because for the most part, what America said and the documents that we created oftentimes spoke of a different America that really existed. So we were being called through democracy in America by Alexis de Tocqueville, live up to what you've written, live up to what you've said. I've got a, a few who are asking some practical questions again about Black Wall Street specifically, and I'll rapid fire them uh, at you. Did they ever find out who was specifically behind the massacres and who, who started it and rallied people up? And did the lady in the elevator recant? Did she ever say, no, this didn't happen? Uh, what was the result of, of that interaction? Yeah, great. The recanting did happen. There was no rape or anything like that. She left town, as did Dick Rowland. There, you know, anytime you have something like this, lore becomes history. And you have to try to decide which piece of this is real now. Because there are some who are saying that they were having an affair. And this could have very easily been uh, happened because on that particular day, on the 30th, downtown Tulsa was primarily closed for Memorial Day. But he was downtown, as was she. So what does that really mean in the real world? I have no idea. But uh, I know a couple of years ago, there was research being done into the Ku Klux Klan and who were some of the main leaders in that Klan were some very prominent people that uh, had been praised and given great applause in, uh, in our city, but at the same time now are being looked at from a different perspective. 
So I, I think truth is like a slow stream that runs underneath everything else, but it eventually finds a way to surface to the top. Another question uh, that has come in, what do we think about the idea of different perspectives? You mentioned uh, truth always coming to the top. That's a, a challenge that we have in today's society, truth always coming to the top. How do you think the idea of different perspectives being ignored or different opinions being canceled, how do you think that could impact our understanding of history, specifically incidents like Black Wall Street uh, into the future? Uh, I'll ask you this question and I'll, I'll ask one more uh, after you've answered. Well, you know, we started out by saying history is a great teacher, but you must go to class. And, and, and that is the premise upon which I stand. Uh, we have not taught history well in our country. We have taught some great things in our country, but we have not told the full story. Our story is still being told. And even when you tell the truth of who you are, it is not destructive as we have once led to believe, but what it does, it gives everybody an opportunity to understand our humanness, the mistakes we make and the opportunities we have. I think today more than any other time, it seems as if the door opener, that history is beginning to open the door and America has not lived up to everything that it has talked about or has been written about, but the opportunity to head in the right direction from my perspective is probably more today than ever before because so many untruths have been brought to the surface that have not been brought to the surface before. Perspectives. Perspectives are shaped by the culture that shapes us. Period. And if those perspective, if though if that culture is never looked at and analyzed, then we will end up always believe in the same information that came to our ears and to our hearts early on. And that is what we hold dear. But in my life, I've had to make a decision. And the decision is, I'm gonna be my better self. And I will raise my household to be likewise. Does that mean everybody will follow suit? I know better because I know history. There will be people who will not like me because of who I am but I will not join their bandwagon to dislike them because of who they are. That's their problem, not mine. I love that. And I'll finish with this. It's a, a few questions in one, as I am prone to do. <laughs> You're good at one, this. One, uh, a, a very easy one. Is there a memorial somewhere in Tulsa or museum uh, where people can learn more about this? Uh, secondly, the question is, uh, you said some people won't like you because of who you are. Who are some people that you like because of who they are? Who are, who are some people that we can point to that are gonna carry this banner forward uh, about the positivity and the, the history of Black Wall Street and Black people? And then the last thing, give us something positive to go home. <laughs> okay, the first thing you asked, let's go back to the first question. What was the first question? First question was, is there a memorial or a museum in Tulsa to learn more? Yes, it is being built right now. And hopefully by June 1st, uh, the uh, May 30, uh, May 31st, June 1st, the, the the commemorative year, that it will be open to the public, and uh, it will be a very a, a very nice facility uh, where the story will forever be. But I hope that it will not be a place that closes our ears and eyes to the journey that moves forward but it becomes a place almost like a gas station, if you will. We go to the memorial to be pumped, to get a new dose of fuel so that we can go out and do something significant for ourselves, for our children, for our family, for our neighbors, and for our friends. That's excellent. Second question, who are some people right now you can point to that you think can help change the system, keep this positivity going uh, for Black Wall Street and Black people? Well, one thing about it, when you look at Black people per se, for which I am certainly one of those people, uh, I, I would say this, 
is that you will find across the spectrum of humanity, may not be as many as we want, but they are there. There will be white Americans who will be holding the banner of equity just as tightly as you or I would hold it. And, and there will be those who wish that we would disappear and never show up again. And that won't happen, but that may be their wish. So I have to live with the reality, how do we get to where we are today? Who were the people who played a role in that? Will something like that happen again? Of course it will. If you look at Montgomery, Alabama, you look at Rosa Parks, you look at all the people around her, the, un the unknown names that we don't know, who fought in the civil rights movement equal to, that has always been and will always be. Brotherhood and sisterhood will always exist as a habit of the heart that demands of us to stretch our table for others. And there will be those who will do so. Well, the last question was to end on something positive. I think you just did. Brotherhood and sisterhood is a beautiful obligation that we each have to one another. So Clifton, brother, we appreciate it. We appreciate this history and this lesson uh, and everything that we have learned from you. Uh, Professor Goman, we send it back to you. Great, I wanna thank you, OJ, for leading this discussion. And Clifton, it was beautiful, wonderful. Uh, I was just reflecting that that you were the last speaker we had in before COVID hit. So it was the last really good dinner I had out, out on the town. I really miss it. And I'm hoping we can get you back in here in person sometime and, and have another dinner. But uh, th this is great. Thank you for sharing this story and shedding some light on this dark time in our history. I want to thank all the audience for coming today. Um, and I put in the chat a little bit about American Experience, a, a video, a documentary called Going Back to T-Town which gives a nice um, history of, of what happened. I'm looking forward to seeing everybody up in our upcoming events. Don't forget the um, College of Charleston events. And so stay safe, stay well, and thanks everybody for coming. And personally, I thank all of you for your hospitality. It continues to be the same. So when you have hospitality like you received at the University of Louisville, that gives us hope to believe that America is that shining city on a hill.